Teşekkür ederim Fiyatlı abi. Sağ ol. Allahu Ekber, Allahu Ekber. Allah. Jihad is at the core of Islamic values and teachings. Unfortunately, today, some Muslims misuse it, and it's oftentimes misunderstood in the West. My name is Jihad Turk. My father told me growing up that my name, Jihad, meant the struggle to do the right thing. He said it might be extra effort for people to say it right, but it's worth the extra effort. The biggest challenge that we face as a Muslim community is that we are so misunderstood. A lot of what I spend my time on is in interfaith relations. So when my friend Charlie Annenberg wanted to learn more about Islam, he came to me. He had this vision where he was going to study what he called the trilogy of books, the Torah, the Gospels, and the Quran. We embarked on a month-long study, and at the end of that, he asked me to join him for this trip that he wanted to take to the Middle East. I remember at one point in the study with Charlie, he said, I believe that Muhammad is a prophet, and he believes in one God. And I said, you know what? That's to be considered a Muslim. He said, well, let's make it formal then. He learned how to do the washing for prayer in what's known as wudu. He joined me in a prayer, and he made his declaration of faith. This is a spot where Muhammad rises to heaven, comes back down. Second holiest spot. At one point early in Muhammad's preaching, he had a vision. He was awoken one night by the angel Gabriel and went on a miraculous night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. There he met with all of the prophets. Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and he prayed together. Then he ascended into heaven, and there he received directly from God the commandment for Muslims to pray 50 times a day. On his way back from that meeting, he encountered Moses, who asked him, how did it go? And he said, it went great. I received a commandment for our community to pray 50 times a day. And Moses said, whoa, whoa, 50 times a day, that's way too much, trust me. I've led a community before. Go back and ask God for a reduction. So he went back 
And God says, okay, 40 times a day. And Moses said, still too much. And it went back and forth a few times until it was reduced to only five times a day. At which point, Moses said, still too much. And Muhammad responded, I'm too shy to ask for any greater reduction. The community began praying five times a day from that point forward. We really don't do a great job of narrating the story of Muhammad to our fellow Americans. Let us today examine how it is that we might be able to convey the story of our prophet in a way that will enlighten those around us. All three of our faiths of Islam, Judaism, Christianity acknowledge Prophet Abraham. We all turn to him and respect him and tell his story in our scriptures. Moses, Jesus, and the Prophet Muhammad were of his descendants. And it's important for us to consider that because it helps us in explaining the story of the Prophet. He is not something very strange or something very foreign. He is as familiar as all of the biblical prophets. He is a descendant of Prophet Abraham. Allahu Akbar. Facing Mecca for prayer is something that unifies all of the believers. Having a focused place to bow avoids great confusion. One of the pillars in Islam is for each Muslim at one point in their life to make a journey to Mecca and to pray there commemorating the deep faith of Abraham. Entering the Kaaba. Christians and Jews know the story that when Isaac was born, Ishmael was sent to the wilderness. Well, Muslims believe that it wasn't such a sibling rivalry, but rather it was God's divine inspiration that instructed Abraham to send Ishmael to Mecca. When he did so, he didn't cut him off, but would visit with him on occasion. And on one of those occasions, when Ishmael was old enough, they built the Kaaba as a place to worship God. It's also the place where Muhammad was born and was raised, and he helped rebuild the Kaaba. I was fortunate to have made that pilgrimage in previous years. When I traveled with Charlie, we went off season, so we did a minor pilgrimage or an Umrah. The Kaaba is an empty brick building, but it's symbolic of so much deep faith. And to think that it's empty tonight and it felt so crowded, but this would be like off, off, off season. I don't think Abraham, the Dorma Hall, had envisioned that it would become such a complex. Do you? No. There's a group of local scholars that would meet regularly and discuss topics about Islam. Charlie liked to call them the Council of Wise Men. One of the things I've been told several times is that when I mention the prophet, peace be upon him, that I always say, peace be upon him. Why is that? The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was always a fear of, um, of being elevated to a deity or being elevated to a level of being the son of God or, or, or similar to what happened to Jesus. It clearly defines that he is a prophet, he is a man, just like all other prophets uh, before him. Because the believing in Islam doesn't mean you deny the non-believer. There's a big misunderstanding here. God wanted that to happen. He wanted a choice. It says in the Quran clearly, I created and I have done, I have done, for those who want to believe or not to believe, equally. There is no thing in the Quran that says, if you don't believe, then you are be, to be killed. If the Prophet was alive today, and I saw Islam, we would see how he would interact with what we today call enemies. And he would interact with them in such a way that he would win them over. You know, he will truly capture their hearts. 
rather than to go down and try to talk to them the language of the sword or the language of, of violence, which gets you nowhere. Muhammad had some leisure time. His wife was a well-respected businesswoman, and he would go on these spiritual retreats. He would go to the mountain. On one occasion, at the age of 40, he had a vision. The angel Gabriel appeared to him and instructed him, read. And he said, I, I don't know how to read. And the angel squeezed him. He said, read in the name of your Lord who created, who created mankind from a clot of blood. Read and your Lord is most honorable. He taught mankind with the pen that which mankind did not know. Lo and behold, more revelation came. At the heart of Muslim prayer is the opening chapter in the Quran, and it's chanted. In the name of God, the most kind, the most merciful. All praise is due to God, Lord of the worlds, the most kind, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. It is you alone that we worship and your help alone that we seek. Guide us along the straight path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed your blessings, not the path of those upon whom is anger, nor the path of those who have gone astray. Muslims recite that in all of the prayers. And so when Charlie embraced Islam and came on this trip and was practicing Muslim prayer, he wanted to learn this in Arabic. Hello. Hello. How you doing? In the middle of this barren place, this shepherd with his herd of, of goat, and in the tradition of Abraham, he had a tent that was open to visitors, and he was very hospitable. And in the tradition of Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, he took us in, he gave us some hot tea and coffee and some snacks. So here we are in a Bedouin tent. Islam has its faith. We walk in, and it's Jesus as a shepherd. I think right there, that's more symbolic than anything I've seen on this trip. People don't understand the reverence for the lineage of prophets and their significance. Look at that. He said, we respect all the prophets of God. Where I'm from, many people are afraid of Islam. Why? <laughs> There was a time in which the Islamic Empire spread by the sword. But we live in an age, not an age of the sword. We live in an age of media, and media has taken the place of the sword. Charlie explained that in addition to seeking out the message of Islam during his time in the Middle East, he was also on a quest to find the best tasting falafel. What's cooking? The falafel. So I took him to my favorite place. Shalom, thank you so much. I'm good. How do you do? Welcome to Jordan. Welcome. This is my friend Jihad. I know, he's my friend Jihad. Okay. Nice to meet you. I feel like I'm talking to Moses with that. The shmuch. Everyone looks so <laughs> smart. <laughs> he says it's uh, dignifying. It is. It is. What's what's why what's the symbolism of the longer beard? <laughs> because the Prophet Muhammad's beard was long, about that length. <laughs> Of course, in the great tradition of Abrahamic hospitality, Thank you. he invited us to his home, and he treated us as honored guests. It's important when talking about Islam to others that you don't focus on the superficial, but rather you 
talk about what's important, and what's important is that their hearts be connected to God, and the rest will be will will follow with ease. When someone does embrace Islam, it's important to focus on what's a priority and not to focus on the details like the mannerisms that are permitted and prohibited, what type of jewelry, what type of clothes, a beard, and the superficial things. Alhamdulillah. This is really nice. Petra was a fiercely guarded Islamic center of trade, a city of rock-cut architecture that dates back to the 6th century BC. No European had ever laid eyes on its wonders until 1812, when Swiss explorer Johann Ludwig Burckhardt embraced Islam and was permitted entry into the storied site. In many ways, I felt Charlie's journey mirrored that of Burkhardt. The discoverer, the explorer who would find this place, was willing to open his heart. And as a result, they led him into the sacred city of Petra. It's that simple. He didn't have to offer them money. That wouldn't have worked. He didn't have to offer them spices, guns, trickery. He just took the time and opened his heart to the ways of Islam. He went to Mecca. He changed his name to Abraham, and he went up to go visit Aaron's grave. That's simple. Open your heart to other ways. As a Jewish person converting to Islam and studying the other religions, the through line to all these people is the connection between the divine and your heart. They all say the same thing. Jesus Christ's birthplace. That's epic. People never really wrap their mind around that Muslims revere Jesus and believe also in the Immaculate Conception. The emphasis of the story of Jesus in the Quran is really about his message. Yes, he performs miracles, but it's really about what he teaches people, what he passes on. And he then really, from the Islamic perspective, gives a balance to the children of Israel who had been following the law but had kind of lost the spirit. And here comes Jesus, born miraculously, is inspired to bring the balance back to religion, so that it's not just about the letter of the law, but it's about the spirit as well. Being on this trip, what I realized is, if it's opening a Torah, or opening the Quran, or opening the New Testament, it's really a metaphor for opening your heart. And so when you open something, that's what I heard. It was like, open your heart as if a set of rules never to be torn apart. It was like a compass. So I'm essentially taking out what is believed to be the direct words from God to Moses right now. Yes, these are the ones which, according to tradition, God dictated word to word to Moses. You can usually hold it, you know. You're doing it right on the right-hand yeah. side. No matter how you slice it, you know, New Testament, Quran, it all is derived from the beginning of these scriptures when God speaks to Moses. The initial inspiration mm -hmm. that would begin the journey to where we are right now. I was going to ask you, what, what well, have I opened well, up to? Just open the Ten Commandments, as it so happens. <laughs> really? So those are the Ten Commandments, which the first two were there is God, and there is no other God, yes? You shall not have any idols. You shall have no other gods. You shall not take God's name in vain. Here is the commandment for Shabbat, keeping Shabbat. You shall keep the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No work for you, your children, your servants, your animals. 
is Moses is probably the most mentioned character. I mean, yeah, it's kind of ironic that the book for that was, you know, as Muslims believe was revealed to Muhammad, talks more about Moses than it does about Muhammad or any other prophet. Really? Moses' story is told in over 44 places in the Quran, and it's his sto story is told in the most detail. Here it's, as Muslims would say, God highlighting the story of Moses because it's so full of lessons for humanity. Jesus is told at some length in the Quran, also more than Muhammad's story is told in the Quran. And so, mm -hmm. so oh, Islam is not, Moses is more though, Moses is more. You can be deeply engrossed in business and whatnot. You hear the call to prayer, and it catches you off guard, and it reminds you, whatever you're doing, there's something more important. It's important for you at this moment to stand before God, offer gratitude, but also ask for guidance and assistance. I remember Charlie said, prayer throughout the day, it's kind of like you're in the Indy 500 race, and you need to go in for a pit stop. You want to just keep going, but you're going to burn out if you do that. It's really important to take a break, get the oil changed, get some new tires on, and then go back out on the track. I really enjoy Wadu. It's about cleanliness before you pray. Just on a basic level, it's just refreshing and you just feel cleaner. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen So let's hear the Fatiha. You've been practicing on your trip, and now you, today, just today, you finally mastered the first chapter in the Quran. Yaka Nabadu Wa Yaka Nestayin. It's coming. Go over the last three one more time. Yeah. You guys want to help me out? Say I do feel the Fatiha. Many are it. Ah Rahman Rahim. Maliki my teacher. Those were our last prayers together there at the Dome of the Rock. After that, Charlie went on to Africa. I came home to Los Angeles. When we were leaving the Middle East, Charlie was confronted with the question, what are you now? Are you Muslim? Are you Jewish? And he answered, look at my character. Look at my heart. And you tell me what I am. Charlie viewed the trilogy of books through the perspective of God's miracles. In the Old Testament, God's miracles were presented through nature, like Moses and the burning bush. In the New Testament, the miracle was in the form of man himself, Jesus. Help me out. Alhamdulillah. 
By the time of the Quran, Charlie felt God's approach had changed. In the Prophet Muhammad, God found a man at his midlife crossroads, a man prepared to accept the responsibilities of conveying God's message. Only this time, it was different. Muhammad was a prophet that didn't come with a miracle. He came with a message that was universal, that made sense to one's mind and heart. The miracle of Muhammad was the script of the Quran and its universal appeal. <laughs> 